back on the Boulevard Sunday, April 14th. As always, here to prove to you there is no such thing as football season. We are presented by the Believe Network tonight. A couple of blowouts this UFL weekend sandwiched in between two fantastic finishes in the XFL Conference that actually pulled the XFL side to a three-way tie for first place. And we're here to bring you all the action that was Zook. Why not? Let's jump right in to week three in the UFL. We started off with an XFL title rematch in Arlington. Renegades trying to avoid that 0-3 start after last year's championship win. Jordan Tamu wasn't going to make that easy. Escaping the pocket on third down, finding Kelvin Harmon along the near sideline to prolong that drive. It put Matt McCrane in field goal range, 54 yards out. That was the kind of McCr uh, day McCrane would have. He had a couple more of those later on in the highlight. Puts DC up 3-0. Third and nine now for Arlington. They actually hit 82% of these in the first half. Tyler Vaughn becoming the wide receiver one for Luis Perez all day. USC product puts the Renegades on the board 6-3. Vaughn, lateral, Davion Smith on the next possession, picks up a third and 14. Not something you see every day here, folks. It was just the check down to Vaughn who laterals it to the running back, Smith, and they turn a two-yard gain into an 18-yard gain. Just poor tackling from the D.C. defense in this first half. Another third down for the Renegades, and you know what that meant. Javante Payton wide open in the end zone, extending that Arlington lead to nine. And Lindsey Scott Jr. becoming a popular option in that two-point conversion package. This time going to do it with the legs, extending for the pylon. Gets the two. All of a sudden, it's an 11-point game in the first half. Things were not looking up for D.C. Right before half came the JT show. He scrambles inside the 20. Now on second and two, Chris Rowland, duck and cover. Rowland gets his first UFL career touchdown, becoming a nice little option in the slot. Made it 14-9, and then into the second half, McCrane from 58. A bomb makes it a two-point game. DC back in it. Perez, second and 18. Vaughn's wide open yet again on the far sideline. Vaughn's nine catches for over 100 yards and a touchdown on the day. Arlington settles for a field goal. Tamu doing it with his legs, sliding, getting into plus territory. Now here on second and 10, clean pocket. Brandon Smith, corner of the end zone, touchdown. Smith pulling DC in front by one. All of a sudden, Renegade fans thinking, what is going on here? We're 13 of 17 on third down for the day, and we're somehow down one. Well, they were going to keep picking those up. Sal Canella fighting for extra yardage here, getting him in the red zone. And again, Lindsey Scott Jr. on third and two with the legs and the layup. Arlington out in front, 23-18. They put Perez back in for the two-point conversion. He finds the open man in the end zone to extend the lead to seven. 12 minutes to go in the fourth. Arlington, chance to ice it here. Letty Brown drops it with just two and a half minutes left. Russolino gonna come out, put him up by 10. Game over, right? Not a chance. Not when you got Jordan Tamu, the XFL Offensive Player of the Year, as your quarterback. And a guy like Chris Rowland, the former Philadelphia star, fields the kickoff. Gotta get him in good field position. Across the 50, turning on the burners, making men miss. All the way inside the 40, Chris Rowland sets up DC on the short porch. Still just two minutes to go. No timeouts for Tamu. Again, QB draw right up the middle. Get seven on first down. Third and one here. Cam Harris, RPO executed nicely. Gets him down to the one. Clock is ticking. No timeouts on the goal line. Got a hand to Harris again, who plows in from a yard out. All of a sudden, we got a ball game. They decide to go for two. They want to win it with a field goal, not tie it. And Jordan does it himself. Took over this game in the second half. DC trails by two. Now we get the fourth and 12. Who are we going to go to? Is it going to be Chris Rowland? No, it's Ty Scott coming up big yet again for this offense. Doesn't start but he always seems to show up when the lights shine the brightest. 38 seconds to go. Should have been picked off, but no, Kelvin Harmon. 
inside the 30. DC going to run it all the way down. Barlow says we're going to win it or lose it here. Look at this. Deron Lowe goes for the pick. Kelvin Harmon, right place, right time. Way to not give up on the play. And from 49 yards out, Matt McCrane, revenge, is a dish best served ice cold. Ice in his veins. Matt McCrane, three for three on the day. Jordan Tamu electrifies the D.C. sideline. Oh, that one felt good, folks. The overcashes, D.C., who was a two-and-a-half-point dog by the time this one kicked off, improves a two-and-one. Not that impressive of a stat line for Tamu, but you had to watch the highlights to know those 53 rush yards he made him count. Matt McCrane, one of the best kickers in the UFL. Defenders getting back to their ways in the red zone. They were three for three on touchdown chances. They trailed by 10 with two minutes to play. And for the Renegades, who at one point looked like they might win this game by four touchdowns, outgained DC, 419 to 259, converted 72% on third down, and lose by one. It's Defenders, 29, Renegades, 28. In Noir, Saturday night primetime game, the ring ceremony in Birmingham, and they were fired up on the first drive on a third and 14. It's Jonathan Garvin, Malls Case Cookus. You figured this was going to be a problem for the showboats up front, and boy was it. Birmingham, their first possession. They roll with Adrian Martinez, getting the start over Matt Corral. Averaging over 10 yards a carry was Martinez, and he kept it up. Third and goal. They try to throw it. Ball tipped at the line. Right into the hands of Jay Sternberger. Right place, right time. Touchdown, Birmingham. 6-0 ball game. Fans liking what they see early. Here's Martinez again. This time, going to fumble it. Force fumble. Showboats came in. Number one in takeaways in the league. Big fella falls on it. All of a sudden, Memphis in business. Case Cookus trying to stay up. This time, Decent job by the O-line. Papali, cross the middle, touchdown, tie ball game. So a quick momentum shift here for the Showboats. Martinez, back on offense, shoulder fake. Marlon Williams beats the defense, touchdown Stallions. Scoring often in the first quarter. Three touchdowns combined over, was looking good. Here's a third and 15 for Cookus on the next drive. Across the middle, stands in, takes a big shot, completes it to Jonathan Adams, gets Matt Coughlin in range to hit from 57. 50 plus yard field goals in abundance this weekend, folks. 12 to nine, Stallions lead it. And like they did the last two weeks, Skip Holtz just finds a way late in the half to sneak one in on you. Not a touchdown this time, but a beautiful throw to Deion Kane. Martinez saying, it's not just my legs, I can do it with my arm. Chris blew it from 46. Crucial points there into the half. 18-12, Birmingham leads. Into the second half now, this is what Martinez can do. Extend the play, throws a rope along the sideline. Deion Kane, what a day he had. Seven catches, over 100 yards for Kane. And Martinez taking a sack here. It was actually one of the first sacks he's taken all season. Big play there for Memphis. They have it in the shadows of their own end zone. And Jonathan Garvin just lays the lumber to Cookus. I mean, look at this hit, folks. Vicious hit. Cookus was taking them all night. I have to give it to Case. He stood in strong. Here's another third down. You know they were just going to bring the blitz every single play. And I don't know how Cookus stayed in this game for even three quarters. Meanwhile, Martinez wasn't taking a sack. I mean, look at this guy. Unbelievable how he sets that up. That should have been a loss of 10. It ends up a gain of nine. Birmingham gets a field goal, 21-12. More of the same. Birmingham, eight sacks on the night. They had seven last week. They might have 40 plus on the year when it's all said and done. Here's Martinez again, just playing backyard football at this point. Ricky Person Jr. with a nice grab along the sideline. That's a running back, folks. They give it right back to him. Let him pay off his own big play. Touchdown early fourth. Birmingham goes up two scores. Memphis going to have to try to throw the ball to get back in it. Case Cookus gets pulled, taking too many hits. They put Troy Williams in. It did not matter. 
who was back there. Mitchell gets the sack off that one. And Martinez just showing off at this point. Corner falls over. Deion Kane gets down the sideline for a big gainer. Martinez, almost 400 yards all purpose in this one. And Matt Corral did not play a snap. I mean, you just couldn't stop him. Birmingham has unlocked their starting quarterback. And it was not what I expected. But boy, did he have a game against a pretty solid defense. <laughs> Again. We might as well show all eight Birmingham sacks here, right? And we'll show a pick. They did it in the secondary. They did it in the front seven. And it was all ponies. Ten consecutive wins. The banner ceremony. 12,000 fans came out. And they were pleased with the performance. The Birmingham Stallions rack up eight total sacks. 18 yards per pass completion. Martinez... 334 through the air, 44 on the ground, three total touchdowns. They hold Memphis to 20 rushing yards. Case Cookus only makes it through three quarters before he gets pulled for his own health. I mean, it was all Birmingham. Stallions 33, Showboats 14. Into our Sunday card, it was Jake Bates kicking us off for the third straight weekend in Ford Field. Michigan front loading that home schedule. Reed Sinet didn't care. His first start of the year goes to Emmanuel Butler down to the one yard line. Sinet gonna do it himself here on the keeper. Houston on the first drive, punching it in. They're gonna go for two. Six nothing already. Two point conversion. Back to Butler. So eight nothing. One of the easier drives on that Michigan defense. We've seen them hold pretty strong, but looked like Houston found something early. E.J. Perry not going to lose this quarterback duel. Goes along the sideline to Trey Quinn, pick up a big third and eight. We don't even have to show you this. Automatic from inside 50. Automatic from outside 50. It's Jake, the earthquake baits, cutting the Houston lead to five. Sinet with a chance to extend the lead, and this is when the Michigan front start taking over. Big TFL there. Give Perry the ball back. Third and ten. Does what he does best. Use the legs. Two rushing touchdowns week one. Gets another one here in week three. Putting the Panthers in front 9-8. Two-point try, no good. Mid-second quarter, Sinet across the middle, picked off by Kai Nakua, who will probably be at all UFL safety by the time this season's over. Looking for the tight end across the middle. Nakua picking that one out of the air off the tip drill. Third and nine now, Sinet with the ball back late first half. Gonna find TJ Pledger for the first down. They needed to punch it in the end zone here. They only get a field goal. Because Jake Bates, as long as he get him to the 45, is going to do what he does here. They iced him on this one again, Zook. <laughs> he hit it twice. Unbelievable. Jake Bates. How are you going to stop NFL teams from contacting him? We'll see about that, Mike Colin. Into the second half. Perry, Marcus Sims. One man misses. Two men miss. Three men miss. Four and five men miss. And Sims, game, set, match. Touchdown, does it again, explosive plays. Michigan relies on them. I don't know how they continue to make this work, but when you got receivers like Sims, I mean, look, Perry made two guys miss. Almost the entire Houston defense had a shot at the ball here. And Marcus Sims, who had a back injury this week, <laughs> looked like he was running pretty well. Lost the towel there on the way to the end zone. Puts Michigan up 18-11. Perry on the two-point conversion. Just in sync with his receivers here. Finds Mariner. Two-point conversion was good. Michigan goes up nine. But here we go on the kick return. Isaiah Henney did it for the Maulers last year. Now with the Roughnecks down the sideline. Is Jake Bates going to have to make a tackle? No, his, his kick coverage unit saves him there. Houston gets a couple of penalties, gets back into a third and 16. They only get half of it here with Pledger. And they got to settle for a field goal to cut it to six from J.J. Molson. So a huge stop there from that Michigan defense from what looked like promising field position. Perry gets it back. He was excellent. Finds Mariner in the plus territory. E.J. Perry hit a second gear in this game that I did not know he had in him. Look at this. Second and 13 right up the middle. It's just a few step drop and a QB draw. They do it well. Better than anybody in the league so far. Look at this. Just... Wash, rinse, repeat for E.J. Perry. Going to put 
Michigan up by two scores on a third down scramble. His dad was loving that. So really a last ditch effort here for Houston and Reed Sinet, and that was not going to go well at the play action. Freeland speaks. Wallops him, and for the third straight week, Houston gets a punt block. Just a mess on special teams. This one recovered by Michigan. Kedrick Whitehead Jr. on the block. Got to feel bad for Hunter Nicewander there, just getting his punt swatted away left and right. Michigan puts this one away with a touchdown run from Matt Colburn. Through three quarters, the Michigan offense, who came in one of the worst in the league, breaks the UFL scoring record. Down 20, Houston holding on for dear life. Big pass there from Sinet. Gets him into the red zone, on the goal line, touchdown. So 7.42 to go, maybe not over yet. Four minutes to play now on a fourth and seven, incomplete. So Michigan hangs on to a 14 point lead. They don't surrender it. Mike Nolan, that defense holds strong. EJ Perry with a gem. Special teams, probably the best in the league. Kai Nakua, Marcus Sims, stars on both sides of the ball. We came into this one thinking Reed Sinet would be the better quarterback, and we were wrong. Can't count out Perry. 208 through the air, 60 on the ground, three total touchdowns. Almost looked a little bit like Martinez and his stat line out there. Marcus Sims continuing to hit on the explosive plays. But I have to touch on the Panthers' offensive line gave up zero sacks. Phenomenal effort from there, even missing a few guys. Houston with a mess of a third quarter, had a punt block for the third straight week. Reed Sinet, not the best day either. It's Panthers 34, rough next 20. That took us into our finale of the week. XFL Conference first place on the line in the Alamo Dome. John Lovett getting the San Antonio offense started with a first down on the run there. The Penn State product putting Ryan Big Toe Santoso in the field goal range. San Antonio opens up the scoring. It's 3-0 early. St. Louis offense was on a mission. Right out of the gate, they established a run with Mateo Durant, who went for over 100 yards last week, looking very strong on his first carry. Now first and 10, mid first quarter. Akeem Butler, been quiet so far this year. Not today, makes a man miss. Houston, or sorry, Santa, uh, St. Louis knocking on the door and it's AJ McCarron showing off the wheels at 33 years old. If you can't stop him through the air or the ground, I don't know what you're gonna do defensively. Here's McCarron on a first and 10. Akeem Butler, his favorite target of the day. Butler breaks out. We were waiting on that breakout performance from him and we got it. 12 to three, early second quarter, and they're gonna go for two. And this is the kind of stuff they scheme up. Bruce Gradkowski, just excellent at calling these two point plays. AJ, the little shovel pass there to his tight end, Jake Sutherland. And it's an 11 point game early. San Antonio, third down. They needed this one badly. Mid second quarter, Cody Latimer gets the first down. Actually, they call it a fourth and one. Now Garber's gonna run a little option play Get him inside the red zone. Third and goal now. John Lovett scores his first touchdown of the UFL season. It's 14 to nine. San Antonio cutting the lead to five. Two point play. Garbers sacked. Peter Talmo Penu, XFL Defensive Player of the Year, showing out for the Battlehawks defense who really limited the big plays, but on the first play of the second half, Jamarcus Bradley gets his lunch money stolen by Darius Phillips. So although they got a field goal to go into half and lead by eight, all of a sudden it's San Antonio ball. So here we go, Brahma's. Chris Payton Jones blowing up the screen. This defense really impressed me. Teams trade field goals. It's 20 to 12, late third quarter. Cody Latimer, GTFO, they call that one. First and goal now for the Brahmas. Chance to tie it with a touchdown and a two-pointer. Anthony McFarland, patient running, finds Pater. 20 to 18, what do you do? Go for two to tie it. They don't get it. AJ, ball back, third and 17. Momentum changer, Hakeem Butler going up in double coverage. Look at this snag, folks. Right at midfield, two men on him, secures the catch, Comes down with it, ball control all the way to the ground, making it easy for AJ. Jacob Sailors. Doing it with his legs. Sailors was inactive last week. Comes in the game, 
has a phenomenal performance in week three for St. Louis. Here's AJ. We said he probably would take a few stacks. There's Jalen Dalton getting in. It was third and 14 now for St. Louis. AJ trying not to take another sack. Pressure breaks down to the end zone. Get a collision from Aitman and Sailors. Incomplete. So San Antonio holds St. Louis to a field goal. And if you knew anything about UFL kickers this week, they weren't missing anything or even getting close. What a weekend from special teams in the UFL. St. Louis goes up five. And then they extend the lead. Sailors back into the end zone. Great day from him. Puts St. Louis up 29-18. Cashes the over. McCarron on the two-point conversion back to Sailors for the Octopus. Gets the touchdown and the two-point play. But listen, no lead is comfortable in the UFL. John Trey Kirkland airing it out. Best QBR in the league to Cody Latimer. And they get Alizé Mack for the touchdown. Here we go again. Are we going to see the Brahmas come back? Don't even have to do the 4th and 12 this time because the defense stops them with three timeouts. Garbers, ball back, 3rd and 4, 25 seconds to go, scrambling for dear life. Incomplete. 4th and 4, game on the line. Garbers across the middle, Kirkland. Triple coverage, can't find him. Anthony Beck gets a second straight win. They go on the road. St. Louis looking awesome on both sides of the ball today. The stunning stat of this one, the Brahmas. Zero plays of more than 15 yards. That is not like them. They were 0 for 3 on PATs. Garbers, 41 pass attempts, 143 yards passing. Only short passes working here. Battlehawks continue to be great in the red zone. Two for two on touchdown chances. And how about the run game? 5.9 yards a carry. Sailors was excellent. It's Battlehawks 31, Brahmas 24. So that results in a three-way tie atop the XFL conference that Zook and I are pretty excited to talk about and break all these games down. But first, we highlighted all the made field goals. We may have missed a few, so we want to re-catch up and let you know that the UFL kickers went 18 for 18. This week. Bad snap. The kick is up. It is good. On the season. Make it six of six. And now to extend the lead. The kick is up. And it is good. Rusalino with the kick. It is good for the win. The kick is up. It is good. Football. The ball is down, right down the middle. And just like that, and he still only missed one. That one. At least oh, tried to squeeze out a couple more plays. Blew it. Made a 22-yarder in his last kick. Blew it. No problem with that one. Only permits 50 plus yarders. Trying to stay perfect, and he does. For real this time. And these kickers. Rex Sunahara to snap it, and Santoso from 35 is good. And the kick is good from 32. And the former Minnesota Golden Gopher knocks it through. Schmidt hit from 44 earlier. This from 54. Does it have enough? You bet. For a five-point lead. Schmidt, don't. Back on the boulevard here, Sunday, April 14th. As always, here to prove to you, there is no such thing as football season. And there is no such thing as missed field goals 
in the UFL. We just watched through that compilation, Zook. We came a long way from Vegas and D.C. in week two of the XFL season when kickers were slipping on the field. Now you have to give them credit. It was a terrible <laughs> night there in Vegas, but we've come a long way on special teams. How many 50-yarders were there this week? There had to be at least five or six in there that I counted, and we, we showed all of them. And none that were really even making you hold your breath. They were all down the middle. I think all these kickers are going to be have to get replaced next year because they're all going to the NFL. Well, but definitely there's only so many jobs. McCrane and Bates are going for yeah. sure, right? Yeah, and even Schmidt today. Schmidt don't stink. I like that call from Drew Carter uh, at the end of that one. But, yeah, I, I don't know what's going on. These kickers have found the magic. They're hitting great balls. We got a lot of indoor stadiums in the league, so that helps. But even the outdoor Kickers playing really well. What a weekend for the specialists. And what a weekend in the UFL. We said a couple of dominant performances from Birmingham and Michigan. D.C. coming back from down 10 with under two minutes to play. And the Battle Hawks looking good in all three phases, outlasting San Antonio and handing Wade Phillips and the Brahmas their first loss. Let's get to our Boulevard best bets here, Zook. Only a three-pack of plays from week three. Uh, I split mine, 0-1 on yours, but you managed to stay 500 for the year. I stay a game up thanks to that push. Dipping below 60% chaps my ass. Yeah, especially because I think if you watch the Thursday show back, I think we hit three or four of these handicaps as far as what we expected out of these games. The part is we were most confident in the game that we got wrong, right? So that was the game that we thought Houston had an edge. We thought the under was probably going to come through. And I had under 38 and a half. There ends up being 54 total points in that game. So I wasn't even close. And I knew when there was points from both teams on the first drive, I might as well pack it in. Now it was 12, 11 and a half. I thought I maybe had a little bit of life until you saw on the highlight, Michigan opened up the second half with a play to Marcus Sims, where he made the entire defense miss. At which point I realized Houston's defense did not come to play the way they did in the first two weeks. And I wasn't cashing this under. And Michigan's dead, and that's what killed me. Yeah. Oh, man. What a mess. Yeah, I, did, I didn't think Houston was going to lose this game by two scores. I thought it was going to be a close one as well. Yeah. I'm Credit a, to Michigan. I'm, I'm actually a little embarrassed. <laughs> you look at my straight picks yeah. with no money on the line, and then you look at my best bet. Oh, boy. Tough week three, huh? How wrong can I be? All of it. Yeah, I, 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 I got Birmingham right. <laughs> Let's go. I can't, like, can't take it back now, but I do wish I had the over in the D.C. game, which we talked about, and we kind of leaned that way uh, instead. But, no, I, I'll ride. I got the one and one The Battle Hawks game went pretty much how I expected. So, four, three, and one for me overall on the season, two and two for Zook. And we've had, I think, nine plays through the first two weeks, and now we had 12 total. Between the two of us. So, more action in week four with all crossover games. They're all so, crossovers. Yeah, so, take oh, a guess where we're going baby. next week. <laughs> we get through best bets this week. I would say still unscathed. I think we're all right from, from our, our week one, and we got to bounce back. Yeah, sorry, folks. I don't have much to say. I'm eating crow this week. <laughs> a lot of it. Yeah, it's pretty clear who the worst team in the uh, UFL is, and I don't think we'll be putting much money on them as the season continues to go on. Yeah, I mean, we're going to need, like, plus 22 and a half for me to bet on them. Yeah, this is kind of what happened with Orlando last year, where how much of an underdog is Houston going to be now uh, playing Arlington? So somebody's got to win. Arlington's right. going to be favored in that game. I don't know by how much, but, man. I'm I'm going to go with, it's going to be at least nine. You think nine? Can you imagine being a dog, a nine-point dog to an 0-3 team? Well, you're, you're putting them with Orlando, yeah. and that's what was happening. And yeah. Orlando was covering the nine. Right. So it makes it interesting to see what side you take of that. Right. Game is in Houston. I, I think it's going to be more like a four and a half and a five, which might give us some value on Arlington, actually. I don't think it's going to quite be um, near double digits yet, but we'll have to monitor that. As the lines come out, they usually come out Tuesday afternoon on DraftKings. All right, Zook, let's get into these games. We... Nope. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> oh. TPG. <laughs> no respect. I need to just paste the sticky note to this microphone 
that has DFS in big letters. And I might throw TPG on there as well because I was so eager to talk about this man, Jordan Tamu, that I forgot TPG gave him out as a starting quarterback in DFS. He racks up 22.8, great showing. And then the sit him, Mateo Durant, did not duplicate his production from week two. That was a great handicap there from TPG. So three for three on the sit did well on the start Take it away on the sleepers, okay? You know what? No, not after the week I had. Wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you slide. This one was tough because That's not we do on. have a Thursday show. That's not on. And him. let me remind our viewers that Anthony Ratliff Williams practiced on Tuesday, practiced on Wednesday, and right before we get to the show on Thursday, and everything's already in, AR Dub looking like a great sleeper play, finger injury. Reed Sinet throwing lasers in practice. So we get the DNP. <laughs> I can't blame him for that. He did update us on his Twitter that Anthony Ratliff Williams was not going to play. That's better than did start and got zero. I'll, I'll say sure, that and especially with an early play like that, you're not really putting that line up till last minute, right? Right. So you know that stuff. So we don't really give him the timeline to do that. I'm going to give you a pass tonight. I'll let you go. It's becoming a running bit on this show that I forget to do DFS. <laughs> and that's because my DFS lineups have been horrible. A uh, couple of last place finishes this week. Ooh. I, I really need to sit down with TPG and get back in the lab and figure this out because I am not doing well in DFS. I might just stick to best bets from now on. But that was our start, sit, and sleeper from TPG. You can catch those every Thursday night going forward. Now let's talk about Jordan Tamu. Wow. He was the best player on the field in this one. He took over the game. He did it in the first half with his legs. Threw a couple of touchdown passes. The receivers starting to emerge here for D.C. A lot of positives. You get a W. You move to 2-1. and one. Matt McCrane is one of the best kickers in the UFL. That's about all the positives I can think of in this one because I'm not going to lie, in the first quarter of this game, after Arlington hit on their first eight third downs, I'm thinking, are we going to lose this one by 20? Because there wasn't a lot of tackling going on. Uh, there was no third down defense. Tyler Vons was wide open on every single play. Luis Perez was comfortable. And if you showed someone that wasn't a UFL fan the first half of this game and asked them to guess the score in the second half, even though it was only a five-point lead, I think, from Arlington at halftime, they would have said, if, if the defense on the red side keeps playing like that in the second half, they'll get blown out. Well, the defense stepped up when they had to. And a lot of people are going to laugh at that because uh, Letty Brown was wide open there in the flat <laughs> on a third and four. It really wasn't anything the D.C. defense did. It might have been the wind. Uh, so thank you to the North Texas winds for blowing that one out of Letty Brown's hands. But, no, this was, this was Jordan Tamu's day. Uh, he was, like I said, the best player on the field. And ultimately, Fred Kice. Great game from the OC. And and I don't know if you knew this up there, talking about on the broadcast. Coach Kice, the OC, loses vision in his eye on Monday. Tuesday goes to the doctor. They said, you have a clogged artery. You need surgery. Surgery Wednesday. Sits out Thursday. Back to practice for the walkthrough on Friday. Game on Saturday. Fred Kice, our football guy of the year. That's off. To Coach Kice. I don't know. I did, actually, I did not know that. This yeah. Is first time hearing that. He had some issues with this last year, losing a little bit of vision. And, boy, he called the gem of a game and, and really put his playmakers in space. And uh, that's that's kind of a life-threatening type of surgery. And, and to come right back, I love you, Coach Kice, and we wish you uh, best health here in the future as we continue to make this championship run. Zook, when you were watching this first half, <laughs> You were probably looking your chops thinking, oh, I had Arlington straight up. I sure it's did. looking pretty good, like it was yep. in week two against St. Louis. I sure did. Same thing. Why can't this team close a game out? 
Uh, well, they always say it comes down to a couple plays a game, right? So we talked about drop pass. A couple, what, coaching decisions along the way. Yeah. Uh, Defense, probably the worst in the league. It, hard to believe. I, yeah, I mean, but came they came into the year thinking they would be pretty solid. But they held up. It's just that yeah. four-minute offense that people are running on them. Right. I think TPG said Swiss cheese, right? Swiss cheese secondary, yeah. It's crazy. and uh, Yeah, that, that last play that set D.C. up for the game-winning field goal, Duran Lowe going for the pick. You're a six-foot corner against a 6'6 receiver. I don't know how many times that's going to work out for you, but credit Kelvin Harmon for making a great catch along the sideline there. I was impressed with the D.C. receivers. You got Ty Scott, who just shows up in the biggest moments on 4th and 12 now. He had a touchdown week one. Touchdown week two, not a starter on this offense. It just keeps coming up in the clutch. Um, running game still non-existent for DC. I haven't yeah. seen really anything out of the running backs. I mean, Cam Harris did have a touchdown from one yard out, but Jordan led the team in rushing by far with 53 yards on the ground. And <laughs> DC is just not a good team. I and I know this is, this I know. is what I get. I know for the most one of the most exciting finishes of the UFL. Season. Sure, and it it was a great finish. It was great for the league, football wise. DC gets bailed out. I mean, come on, that fourth and bailed 12. out by Jordan though. That who, fourth and twelve, there was nobody around. Yeah, what who, coverage are you running? Who is stopping Jordan Tamu in these situations though? Because this is something in the red zone, where DC going back to last year, Fred Kais has something figured out down there. How many times do you just let a guy wait two seconds and run right up the middle for seven? Happened a lot in the Michigan game <laughs> as well with EJ Perry. We'll get uh, to that. But. Yeah, yeah, and I'm talking about it. Like, have you heard of a spy? Have you heard of it? Yeah, I want to touch on a situation late in the game too, so I can maybe get your thoughts a little bit. So 30 seconds left, Kelvin Harmon with a huge catch along the sideline. Reggie Barlow decides, let's just run it out. McCrane has hit from 55 and 58. Let's run this thing out. We'll get it down to like four seconds. We're going to win it or lose it right here. And that was after a great two-point call to make it 28-26 instead of 28-25. So now you have a chance to win with a field goal. So they run it down to four seconds. 44-yard try for McCrane. Out of a timeout because Arlington iced them. Delay a game. Unacceptable. I'm ripping my hair out at that point. Unacceptable. Not because I don't trust Matt McCrane, but because there's been some issues in late game situations here, we had the two minute warning timeout before yep. against Houston. Uh, some questionable fourth down play calling from Reggie Barlow in week one. And I'm sitting here thinking, what are we doing? That's the, that, I mean, you can't get a delay game out of a timeout. And, <laughs> no, and, and Barlow, it's... Barlow was pleading with the officials like, you didn't reset the clock, but they had plenty of time to get their kicking team out there. Thank God, Matt. You already is. know what you're going to do. Why aren't they ready? Yeah. So, if that's uh, Jake Bates, maybe back him up. Maybe sure, yeah. <laughs> a little yeah, more yeah. like, but I don't, I don't want to back up in the winds, you know, that I, we're swirling around in uh, Choctaw Stadium. And we'll talk about this too later. Like, uh, a special team not having a special teams coach on each squad seems to be translating into poor clock management yeah. or whatever it is. And right. and DC, we've been talking about their clock management for weeks, right? Uh, every week, right? Yeah, I don't think these field goal kickers even need special teams coaches at this point, but certainly the kick coverage units and everybody else and who needs, needs, needs to get in position who to, needs to go into succeed. the goddamn game. Yeah, it was 49 <laughs> yards out in a swirling wind that could have been 44. Those five yards matter. You ask any kicker, they're like, yeah, you're you're not helping me. We're, here, so I'm, I'm pleading for the audience to drum up a cool nickname for McCrane. Yeah. Because we need one. We big, got the earthquake. Big game, McCrane. Ah, I could do better than that. I could do, yeah. do better than that. All right, we'll, we'll sit on it. Yeah, let's workshop that one. <laughs> TPG, let me know if you got anything on we'll that We'll take one. suggestions. So, to close this one out, DC goes to 2-1. and one. They needed this. Needed it badly. Conference win. Next up, Birmingham and St. Louis. Make or break the season right here, Zook, in the middle of the year. You go to Birmingham. You come back home for St. Louis the next two weeks. To me, if you split those two, that's probably about the best you can do. I don't think you're going to win both. If you can manage a split against the best two teams in the league, I'd be happy with that. And then 
Um, if you do take a loss to St. Louis, maybe you get them later in the year. Um, I think there's more of a chance for D.C. at this point to beat St. Louis because they're more familiar. Um, Birmingham poses some problems for D.C. We'll get to that on Thursday. All right, so hold on. Yeah. You're saying D.C. plays who next week? Stallions. Oh, boy. Champs. All right. Yeah, he's cooking up his best bet over there. No, you- actually, no, I'm cooking up. <laughs> How many points I got to give you for our old D.C. Seattle bet? Because I don't have a team now. Oh, okay. So you just default to the best team in the league now. That's your team. Well, I mean. If that's not the no, most I said I would. I said I would just spot your points. I'm gonna be spotted points. They're probably gonna be. DC's probably gonna be a five point dog, four point dog. I wouldn't be surprised. After I'll, so I'll give you what spreads come out Wednesday. It's usually Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday night. Yeah. I, whatever it comes out, I'll, I'll give it to you, and we'll do a we'll do a challenge bet if you deal. If I'll you're man right enough, now. if because if you're man enough. Listen, we'll get it in the preview on Thursday, but they need to practice them. Yeah, here we go. All right. Bet. Yeah, get in, the, get in the middle. <laughs> they need they need to practice some tackling because they couldn't bring down anybody in the first half. A lot of missed tackles and Arlington went seventy two percent on third down. I'm gonna repeat that. Seventy two percent on third down and lost this game. What's next for the Renegades? Well, on the schedule it's Houston, which has to be a get right spot, and I assume um, a spot where they could feel the fury of Bob Stoops in week four. But you just, for the second straight week, can't close a game out that you probably should have won against two really good teams. You had an opportunity to beat St. Louis. You had an opportunity to beat D.C. And they kind of pissed it away at the end of those games. And defense fell apart. On the last drive against St. Louis, they did it again against D.C. We're sitting here, Zook, and the XFL champs are 0-3. Where do you go from here if you're Bob Stoops? I don't know. I, I, I'm i not expecting this to happen. I really thought they were going to beat D.C. They should have beat D.C. They had, they had chances. Every game they had chances. Except for Birmingham. I mean, second half, they just fell right. apart. But... They could have been 0-1, though, and been okay. It, I mean, now you're 0-3, and it's like you have no shot at the playoff. I mean, I, you're not getting in at 4-6 and six this year. <laughs> not in this league. But that's D.C. and Arlington, which was the most exciting game of the weekend. Uh, Briley Moore, our guy who was SportsCenter Top 10, did get a little banged up. We're going to keep an eye on his injury. Um, but, man, way to battle for D.C. to get to 2-1. and one. Next game was a primetime game. It was a USFL conference clash. Birmingham was a seven and a half point favorite over Memphis. Uh, you figured, you know, Case Cookus would come into this one with some confidence. Uh, he's faced this defense from John Chavis a few times when he was with uh, Philly and actually performed okay. They had some problems with him. Now, the issue here is this is a different Stallions personnel grouping on defense with almost all of them having NFL experience and you got a guy back in Scooby Wright who has been there all three seasons and this got ugly I actually saw the TVMA rating pop up in the top right corner after Cookus took like his third hit and they were like parents strongly cautioned for violence (laughs) Um, they're violent they're aggressive they're strong, and they're fast, and it just feels like men against boys. Is there an offensive line that can contain this front seven? It didn't look like it. I mean, we talked about Cookus and, you know, has a little mobility. John D. Filippo said he, he can get away from the rush. He was not getting away from it. Um, Memphis offensively has no run game. They ran for 20 yards, 1.7 a carry. It's It's – 1.7. It's pro- Yeah, the, the running back Titus Swen had six carries for 14 yards. It's it's just one-dimensional. Cook is having <laughs> to throw it. And he did find Vinny Papali for a nice touchdown to tie it Do up. Do you think that you can run six times for 14 yards? If I ran against Birmingham's defense, I would have a broken neck on the first play. <laughs> In fact, I would I'd probably just run backwards and try to beat them to the tunnel. 
So, Birmingham offensively. We were talking about this a little before the show, Zook. Um, going into this, you said hot hand. That yes. They, they would stick with whoever's playing well. So Did we? Inter- did I say that on air, or is that just conversation? No, we were talking us. about okay. it last week because I was interested in this quarterback dilemma that Skip Holtz was going to come into week three with. And it seemed as the week went on leading into this that they were promoting Adrian as QB1. They did some social media stuff with him, announcing him as QB1, and I'm like, okay. So they are pretty committed after his performance in week two to Adrian. Um, and the data backed that up, believe it or not. He was actually having more successful drives and being more efficient than Corral. So Martinez comes into this. It's his offense. Leads his team right down the field, scores in the first drive. But the second drive, he fumbles, which has been a problem of his. Yes. Right? And when you're running around like that, like crazy, trying to make something happen, that could be an issue, as we saw with Ben DiNucci last year. Yeah, what did I say about Ben last year? Remember high school? Yeah. He just had to carry the football around all day. (laughs) Everybody tried to punch it out. Right. But Memphis did what they do, and that's generate takeaways. They they came in the number one defense in the league in takeaways, and they get one there, and then Cookus goes right down and scores. All of a sudden, it's a ball game, and I'm thinking, okay, here comes Corral. No. They stuck with Martinez, and because they did. Not that, a snap. Not a snap. Because they stuck with him there, that was the most pivotal decision that Skip Holtz could make for the rest of the season. Because you gave the kid the confidence to stay in there, and he goes and has the game of the year. 334 passing yards, another 44 on the ground, three total touchdowns, and he just looked better than everybody on defense. Kids balling. Yeah. Kids balling. I want to ask this. Do you think the Memphis defense struggled because they probably game planned? for Corral, and then Martinez comes in and just balls? I don't think so because they are a very similar threat. And I think the no, off- – the, Well, the <laughs> offense can run – like, for example, right, when you have Luis Perez and Lindsey Scott Jr. in Arlington, you can't run the same offense. It's, it's very different when they bring Scott Jr. and there's a whole package installed for him. Corral and Martinez can rotate without the offense changing. So, yeah, Martinez runs more, Corral throws more, right? Well, we, we know that coming He's out. definitely more explosive. Well, Martinez was running 10 yards a carry. I mean, look at it in, in this game. What did he average on the ground? He had five for 44. So he gets to 8.8 yards a carry again, boosting up his average. And he's got receivers like Deion Kane, seven catches, 144 yards to help him out. I mean, they did it before the half again. They did this against Arlington, which cashed you your best bet, basically. Yes. They score right before the half. They did it last week this against Michigan. This time it's Michigan. only a field goal, though, right? Yeah, they did, they did two touchdowns and a field goal, but still, you're it's a 15-12 to 12 game. You go in up by six. Why do teams keep falling for this? They're not giving up. They're not going to sit on it or knee it out. They're going to score. And, like, Skip Holtz loves this stuff. It's becoming an art form for this Birmingham offense to sneak one in on you. And uh, eight sacks for the defense, that's 15 through two weeks. They could get to 40-plus. They really could. I mean, I – you think about the guys along this front seven, and you just name them off with, <laughs> I mean, Carlos Davis, Jordan Thompson. I mean, even a guy like Jonathan Garvin all over the place last night. I think Birmingham has benefited from the league's easiest schedule so far. But, that's not to say they're not the best team in the league. I do want to see them against D.C., St. Louis, and San Antonio, right? I think that's what we're all waiting for. Can they replicate the success? Because Not they, so much against San, San Antonio anymore. You Really? You're giving up on the Brahmas just like that, huh? I'm not giving up on them, but they are. I mean, I love, I love A.J. Don't but... count them out yet. <sighs> Third straight week, Birmingham gets to 100 rush yards. Only 100 on the dot, but still 100. Uh, Martinez with half of those, but 18 yards of completion. That's important to point out. Sure. So Martinez throws it 28 times, which is a lot for him. By far the most of the season for this offense. He completes 18 yards per pass completion. For perspective, San Antonio didn't have one single play (laughs) over 15 yards in the entire game. And Birmingham goes 18 at completion. Would um, you say 334 for him? 334 and 44 rushing, almost 400 all purpose. And 144 for Deion Kane. Jay Sternberger, the tight end, four catches, 73 yards, and a touchdown. And that the special teams has been very good. When Chris Blewett comes on, he does not blow it. 
Um, we have Memphis, a uh, little foreshadowing here, at 7 again in the poll. We've had them at 7, even when they were 1-0. Uh, there's no offensive line. There's no run game. Case Cookus is out, stranded on an island by himself. I don't know how he made it through three quarters of this because he took a beating against the Brahmas last week, came in already suffering from that game, right. and then got his clock cleaned immediately on the first drive. I have to give it to Case Cookus, one of the toughest guys I've ever seen, and he is a big kid. Absolutely. Six foot but, six, but, man. I mean, we're talking three weeks in a row. What are we talking Just about? battered. Zero second half. Right. Oh, yeah, and they had to actually put Troy Williams in the backup quarterback because Cookus was just getting killed. It was hard to watch. It was really hard to watch. And is that that the Memphis offensive line is, is one of the worst in the league? Yeah, some of that. But is it just the Birmingham front seven is coming and you can't stop it? I'd sure. more towards and that. I, I think uh, I'm going to be killed for saying this, but I wasn't really sold on them, Birmingham, until now. They weren't this dominant up front against Arlington. And last two weeks though. They could have they could have put teams away early. Haven't. Same thing. Right. It's like they struggled. So I wasn't sold. I'm not saying that I wasn't saying they were the best team in the league. I, I feel that way. But I'm like, what did we talk about? We talked about are they that much better than everybody else? No. That was my so but like you're saying, let's see him against yeah, they got the three and St. Louis. They were expected to get the three and out. They're gonna they're just gonna absolutely dominate T C. So let's see them against St. Louis. <laughs> I'll tell you this. They were seven and a half point favorites here. They were seven point favorite against Michigan. I think they were a couple point favorite against what, you got them at three and a half against Arlington. They'll probably be four, I'm gonna say, against DC. Um and I, I just even Mark Gilbert I think that's gonna be higher. Mark Gilbert, their number one corner, had a kid. Shouts to him, becoming a father. And he was out. So I'm thinking, okay, Case Cookus can carve up here. Nope, didn't matter. Secondary still, I mean, the, the front seven did their job. Secondary held strong. Cookus only 139 yards passing. And did the eight sacks. It's, I mean, no team's getting close to that. There were teams that didn't have a sack this week. So Birmingham bullies Memphis, who is not a good football team, uh, not a playoff team. I think it's pretty clear. Uh, we'll get ready for the USFL championship game. It's Birmingham and Michigan. Unless something severe happens to Michigan, which I don't think it can because, he, like, they're good enough of a team where their defense is good enough to where even if you have a major injury on offense, you're going to be all right. I mean, yeah. we, we can pretty much write Memphis out of the playoffs. At and this they point. clearly have the best kicker in the league. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so are we locking that in already? Week four, Birmingham and Michigan, USFL championship. I'm ready. I think I'm, I'm ready prepared to, to say, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I, if we're agreeing, so it's yeah. never going to happen, right? Memphis is just a mess right now, and it's – I don't know how you fix this if you're John D. Filippo, but uh, it's not off to a good start. And they have to go to St. Louis next week. Which is in tough for dome. me, too. In the Dome is your next – no chance for a bounce back here. It's tough for me, too, because I love them. I, w oh, I yeah. wanted to see them have success, but, I mean – Yeah, I'm a D. Filippo guy as well. I think he's – He's on the right track. I think if he stays here, they can develop some talent, but it's not the year this year. Right into Sunday. Wow. This was a surprise of the week for me. Not that the Panthers won, but that there was 54 total points in a game I thought was going to be 12-9. Michigan, where to start? Earthquake. EJ Perry, all the way back. I like Earthquake first. Jake the Earthquake Bates. I mean... We had a story earlier this week that, and Zook, you actually asked me this before the show last weekend. Well, it turns out the answer is no. NFL teams are not allowed to contact Jake Bates, and some agents have been <laughs> already trying to get a hold of him, and Mike Nolan not happy about it because, you know, you got to play by the rules here. But, yeah, Bates again, you know, sneaks one in before the half from 55, goes two for two on field goals again. Um. I don't want to take him for granted, but, like, yeah, uh, we know what to expect from Bates. Now, what I didn't expect is the offense to turn it on like this in the second half. A uh, game that was 12 to 11 at halftime, sitting on the under 38 and a half, thinking, okay, 23, not ideal, but let's slow it down in the second half. Let's get the defenses some adjustments made, and 
Yeah, Michigan drops 22 in the third quarter. They score on the first play from scrimmage of the third quarter. Under was cooked. I was dead. And I'm thinking that was my most confident play of the year. I, I got swept up in this trap again. I did it with Orlando and San Antonio. Last year when I thought they were the worst two teams in the league, they go off for like 50 points. I don't know what it is when teams that are awful and incompetent on offense coming into the game, they just decide to turn it on against each other. I, I'm going to take full credit for that. EJ must have been watching the show. And I didn't even think he was playing. What, what did I, I say? He was I was banged like, up. Eh. I'm not betting on him ever. Cause he he I, reminds I, me of Danucci. I'll continue to say it. Take over your turnover machine. Like, yeah. what is going on? He was throwing a lot of picks, and he led the XF, or the UFL in picks. What did he throw for? 208. 16 of 19. Yeah, that's what it was. It was 16. It yeah. wasn't the yard. Right. It was the and no picks. 16 of 19, no yeah. turnovers. Right. No picks. Yeah. Wow. Um. And, and the Michigan defense will continue to say it. Colin Bauer, early candidate for uh, coordinator of the year. The first year D.C. there in Michigan. Just, I mean, we really thought Reed Sinet was the better quarterback coming in, and we were wrong. It was it was E.J. Perry. Uh, 60 yards rushing for the uh, for Perry, two touchdowns. I mean, he scored three times. So unbelievable day. Even when they didn't really have a running game outside of him, next leading rusher was Matt Colburn. Nine carries, 28 yards. Houston did a good job bottling up West Hills. He was only 15 carries, 23 yards. But uh, Marcus Sims is a guy in this receiving core that if he continues to make big plays like this, is going to find himself in the NFL. Absolutely. I'm just sad for ex-Eagles this week in the yeah. UFL. Yeah. That's, I'm, I'm very sad. Yeah, especially because Sinet went right down the field. He's getting the interview on the sideline. You know, they're saying, what were you looking at there? And he looked like he was having a good time until uh, Breland speaks sacked him on a play action that just looked like one of the hardest hits of the weekend. Uh, he wasn't hit quite as much as Cookus, but they got to him a few times, and the most impressive unit of the day for me was the Michigan Panthers offensive line, who was missing some pieces. Actually only had five linemen at one point after one came out of the game, and they allow zero sacks to a team in Houston that was getting to the quarterback and had a lot of TFLs and sacks generated. So I was, I was impressed with uh, Perry getting the ball out quick and not taking any sacks. And there were a couple instances in this game where you probably noticed if you were watching on TV, uh, Michigan got a few free first downs when the true line measurement came up and they said, oh, he's nine inches short. I don't know. Not good for the under. Yeah, I <laughs> wanted that. About I that. really did want to touch on that. Yeah. Like, wh what's your thoughts on that? So the sequence that we had in the Michigan game was a fourth down, I believe. And it was nine inches short by the true line. But as you know, in the UFL, the true line full screen graphic that they show on TV that also comes up on the Jumbotron in the stadium, I believe, uh, shows after the ball is spotted. So it's based on the referee's spot. So at that point, are you going to look at it? Are we going to stop the game? You know, get Blandino to take a look? No, we're just, they just play on. I mean, it's like the full screen graphics off the screen, and then all of a sudden, Perry's. Halfway into his five, but why drive. not? Like, I don't know. We don't, want, we don't want we don't want chain we don't want a chain gang coming out. That takes fair. too much time, right? Yeah, there's an official that just spots the ball. That's his only job, and Absolutely. it's on the spot. Yeah. And you have true line, so why aren't they utilizing it in the game? Yeah, but did they hurry up? That's I think what it was. Like I said, when they took that that measurement off, it was Perry was already halfway into his throwing motion. So I think Perry is is aware of that stuff he is an ivy league guy Ooh. so i think he probably looked up at the scoreboard and uh oh let it go 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 one go, on go. one on one all on. right uh, <laughs> makes sense because you know when you have the under you hate to see that kind of stuff uh the fact was this was a bad handicap for me i i was on the wrong side and i knew i was on the wrong side when the espn bet thing came up and three of the four broadcast crew members were also on the under I'm thinking, oh, yeah, yeah that's bad. What was it? Thir <laughs> 38 was that? and a half. Well, closed at 37 and a half. I got 38 and a half. 38 and a half. 54. Great job. Good pick. Great job on Houston plus two and a half there, buddy. Lose by 14. <laughs> I'm going to bust your Call balls. Call a spade a spade. Here. I'm going to bust your balls. I had a horrible week. So. Guy bets on the worst team in the league to cover. What a guy. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, that was, that, was, that was Michigan basically proving to me that they are going to be in the USFL playoffs as a two seed. I don't know. I don't see Memphis. Next game, I picked them. this one wrong, too. Yeah, this was a lot of uh, hype coming into this. They thought game of the week. I was 
kind of like, oh, you're disrespecting the XFL title rematch, and that one ended up delivering. But this one, of course, did as well. There was a lot of points. Uh, four for four on overs, which is a, a tall task considering we were four for four on unders in week one. And this one had some scoring. Battlehawks 31, Brahmas 24. Uh, I don't know about you, Zook. I know you're pretty high on, on the Brahmas coming into the week, but I'm going to pat myself on the back here. I titled the video <laughs> of the preview of this one, Why the Battlehawks Will Hand San Antonio Their First Loss. Keep in mind, I also titled the week one St. Louis video, uh, Why St. Louis Will Blow Out Michigan. <laughs> so... <laughs> You could tell if you ever go on our YouTube channel, the title of the video is basically the confidence I have because I know I'm going to look like an ass if I get it wrong. I was all in, all in on AJ McCarron, not Smith, this weekend, and he delivered. Uh, weird stat line for AJ, 19-27, 152 yards and a touchdown, 31 points. I didn't expect them to uh, get 31 points if he only had 152 yards passing, but Right, run game quite strong. A, quite a few field goals, 5.9 yards a carry in the run game. Uh, they just have a rotating, revolving door of tailbacks. It was Wayne Gallman week one. It was Mateo Durant last week. Now it's Jacob Sailors wow. making a name for himself. Gallman didn't really just do too much week one, did he? No, he got stuffed yeah. on a fourth and goal that basically cost me a cover. But So we got two out of three is what we're saying. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. If, I guess Gallman wasn't active this week. I, can, I guess they'll continue to do that with how Sailors and Durant have looked. Uh, is that what they're doing? Just bringing two, two backs, and that's it. Yeah, I don't think you you have any reason to make a third running back active. I don't think I've seen that really anywhere on any team. I, some some have like a running back receiver hybrid. Gotcha. That yeah, can yeah, kind yeah. of play both, but I don't think you really need three tailbacks, right? You got your third down back and your your starter. It's just weird because I'm I'm so used to the NFL. Yeah. You got you got three. Oh, you got course. three backs. Yeah. Yeah. This is a uh, fifty guys active on yeah. game day, so it's it's it's. it's not, not as much space, but yeah, uh, let's talk about Hakeem Butler. Wow. Uh, turning point of the game, St. Louis up uh, 20 to 18, I believe, on a third and 17. So Brahma's only down two. Chance to retake the lead, force a punt, and Hakeem makes one of the catches of the year in double coverage. And if you forgot about Hakeem Butler, he's back. I mean, that was a guy who led the XFL in receiving. He didn't unfortunately, go I have to give you credit because I know that we talked about. Aitman's going to see a little more coverage, a little yeah. more attention. And that is, does that open Butler up? Yep, yeah. sure did. Yeah, this is going to be a different candidate every week. Whether I mean, think about when Peasy comes <laughs> oh, Yeah, let's... Like, people forgetting about that. He's on Twitter today saying, good team win. Boy, uh, he's invested. He was signing autographs AJ's, in St. Louis. AJ's going to feast when yeah. he comes back. Yeah. What, we got two more weeks? I think he said. Week five? Out for six. So I thought be, he was coming back, back week seven. We'll see. We'll see if they rush him back. I don't think they have to. No, you shouldn't at have this to. point. I mean, if you were like zero and three Arlington, maybe. But no, St. Louis is off to a good start. And uh, so let's touch on this. Um, we talked about Brandon Silvers being QB three for St. Louis. Did that cause the St. Louis Battlehawks to have some intel? that they otherwise wouldn't have had on A.J. Smith's offense because Silver started all season for the Roughnecks in this very same A.J. Smith system last year. It was something that I was like, when I was handicapping this game, I was like, all right, well, you got to pay some attention to it. I think it did. No completions over 15 yards, no plays over 15 yards. Chase Garbers threw the damn ball 41 times and had 143 yards passing. That's shocking. 3.7 yards of play. How does that even happen? So Donnie Abraham, the defensive coordinator, kept everything underneath. That's what they played it. They said, we're just not going to let this team beat us deep because they have Speedy Stevenson. Oh. They have John Trey Kirkland who could burn. Uh, they got backs who could catch the ball. McFarland and Lovett both very fast. And Cody Latimer. So I guess they just said, we're going to make, make Garbers check down, keep everything in front of us. And that's what they did. Um, yeah, they did tackle well, right? Yeah, PETA was in the face of Garbers the entire night. Um, they got a few ex-Vipers uh, on that team that can play, huh? Yeah, and a few Dragons. Chris Payton-Jones, again, continues to be the number one corner in St. Louis. He's showing out, but surprising stat, no sacks for St. Louis, and they, they still win. I, we talked about getting to the quarterback and how I thought Garbers would take a few. He did not. Um, 
So I, it wasn't really much of a pass rush for St. Louis as it was a hell of a scheme. And and San Antonio ran the ball a lot. Uh, they actually had 28 carries for 102 yards. They split carries between Lovett and McFarland. Um, Stevenson was a non-factor. Four catches, 13 yards. That's his lowest output of the season. Did I have too much respect for uh, San Antonio's defense? Is that what's going on? I just felt I, don't know. I just I, felt they were really solid. Yeah. And they haven't proved to be. I mean, they're giving up 31 last week. <clears throat> excuse me. Last week they're giving up nine first downs right. for over penalties. Yeah. Like Yeah, it's they got to get it right. It seemed like they there really was do. a lot of wide open receivers and even when they did cover receivers, they didn't win the 50-50 balls. They had some right. guys in double coverage. And they are banged up, and they missed Delonte Scott. Oh, he, yeah. he was out of this game, and you could tell that Jordan Williams still had a great game. He's the captain of this defense, but the secondary was hurting. Um, they'll get some key pieces back, and, and they signed Cam Dantzler, so that'll be interesting to see if he fills right in as a starting corner. But um, St. Louis has the most sound offense in the league. It's fun to watch. Sure. It's, it's very calculated. And they know how to get guys in space, and they know how to take attention kind of away from AJ, where you don't really necessarily, you're not focusing on AJ as a defense anymore because there's so many playmakers on the field, right? And then he runs for an 11 yard touchdown. Right. So, what was the, what was the stat on sacks for San Antonio? Two. Two. Two sacks. I was very worried about that offensive line. Yeah, they for St. Louis. They run block well now. That that first week, I was like, "Oh, dude, AJ is gonna be running for his life. Oh, yeah. What are you gonna do?" Right. And I they they solidified that. So yeah, yeah. Steven Gonzalez, our guy, had a big run blocking game. I think when the PFF grades come out, you're gonna see some pretty good grades from this offensive line. San Antonio offensive line was a question mark for me. I thought they actually held their own pretty well against the St. Louis pass rush, but. Yeah, I mean, it's just the wide receivers are too good. The running backs are too good. And they don't and even got the best quarterback in the league. They don't even have the best player on the field yet. And the kicking game, again, uh, I'm blanking on his name from last year, uh, the kicker for St. Louis, but Donnie Hegman. Yeah, Hegman. No yep. longer with the Battle Hawks. Andre Schmidt comes in, and he's been good. I mean, kicks a game-winning field goal week two, goes three for three this week, so. The broadcast didn't say this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. Schmidt's the shit, right? <laughs> I said Schmidt don't stink. Yeah. I said Schmidt happened. Yeah. Uh, A.J. Smith didn't look too happy on the sidelines when Wade Phillips called a timeout late in this game. It kind of felt for a second like it was a sweat when it was 31-18 and they go down and score. He had John Trey Kirkland throwing the ball again, which seems to be a wrinkle that they add in every game. But, yeah, they go down and score to Alizé Mack. It's 31-24. And... I want to ask you, Zook, two minutes to go. You're down 31-24. You got three timeouts. Do you take the fourth and 12, or do you kick? Because they kicked. I, I like to kick. They kicked, and they stopped them. Now, yeah. things got testy on the sideline. Cole Kubelik, who I believe is one of the best sideline reporters in the UFL, I love the work he does, stuck the mic in, in Wade Phillips' grill and said, Coach, why'd you go for it? Or, sorry, why'd you kick off? And Wade goes, what? And he goes, why'd you kick off there instead of fourth and 12? And he goes, three timeouts. Like he, shrugged the, he shrugged the question right off. It was kind of hilarious. I don't, I don't hate it. Yeah, it I really don't. They got Garbers the ball back with 40 seconds left and plenty of time. I mean, they're down there in plus territory with a chance to score. Right. And, yeah, again, pass coverage for the Battle Hawks. Very good. Very good game from the linebackers. A uh, very good game from the secondary, and I have more confidence in this defense than I did against Arlington, where they gave up a lot of pass yards and a lot of third downs. Uh, San Antonio, better on third down this week. They go 9-16. of 16. They actually had a drive that was 17 plays. More methodical than you would expect from A.J. Smith, who likes the deep routes. Right. I still think, and I'll die on this sword, this Battlehawk sword, Brandon Silvers, knowing that offense, mattered in this game i know we'll never know for sure i think it mattered 
I think it, I think he met with the defensive. Maybe coordinator. we could get with AJ after the season and ask. Yeah, let's him. ask that after the season. Yeah, I'm curious. They're though. not. They're, he, nobody's going to admit to it during. But yeah. you, you might be right. Yeah, NFL like, signs people right. from the other squad. Yeah, just to find out. They yeah, don't even play. Silvers is like, this is what we do. This is exactly what we do. This is what we did last year. You can watch it on film. Fine. Go ahead. Watch Houston's offense from last year. Or I'll just tell you exactly what it is. Right. And, yeah, they sit there in the quarterback room with Bruce Gradkowski, and they sit in the defensive meetings and say, this is what it is. And, and A.J. Smith definitely strikes me as a guy who's like, I don't care if you know what it is. We're still going to beat you. Right. Not today. Didn't work today. I have, I, I, before we move on to the close. I want to ask one thing. Do you think that because everybody's mic'd up and you get to go back and watch that, that is an advantage to D coordinators? Yes and no. I say yes because, like, a guy like Colin Bauer for Michigan has definitely used that. I just don't know if some of the older traditional defensive coordinators care enough to run that film back and are going to be like, that invested in something that might change from week to week. I think you ask a lot of defensive coordinators and they say, we're worried about us. As long as we execute our game plan, we're going to be okay. But yeah, it's absolutely a tool that you, everybody should be utilizing. Absolutely. And yeah, you have to change. Like I think in the playoffs, that's going to matter big time. I think Arlington did a lot of that with DC knowing what was coming. Well, those are our games from UFL week three. And the part of the program where we <laughs> cause a debate in the chat. Uh, coming into this year, I was iffy on, on power polls and power rankings because it was oversaturated on Twitter and X. And, you know, everybody and their cousin has a power ranking now. Most of them suck. I will say Mike Mitchell's have been very good. In fact, Mike has been a sharp. He called the D.C. defenders winning 29 to 28 on the dot. And he had the over. Mike is a yeah, – he just has his crystal ball out for the UFL. So Legend. Yeah, we got to get Mike on the show, and uh, we'll see how different – I think he puts his power pole out on Monday morning. We'll see how different ours is. Uh, let's run the power polls. Look, I got Birmingham at one for obvious reasons. It's close with St. Louis. In fact, gun to my head, I picked St. Louis to beat Birmingham today. But this is about who would be favored on a neutral field. I still think Birmingham would be a couple of points of a favorite based on that defense at this point. Uh, San Antonio is going to fall one spot to three. They did beat D.C. I'm not going to punish them for a loss to St. Louis. Um, I think they have a lot of players that can still get healthy and are right in this playoff mix. And I'm very curious to see how they respond from this loss against Michigan next week, which will be a tough opponent. Um, the tough one is D.C. at four over Michigan at five because I know I'm going to get some pushback from that. Um, Michigan with a win over St. Louis, my number two team. Uh, D.C. has only beaten number six, number eight, and that's it. So I just, I just feel like D.C., on a neutral field is a, is a slight favorite against Michigan tomorrow. But the Panthers are a very underrated five. We kind of drop off from there. Arlington at six, at 0-3, still has three or four wins in them. I think they could beat Houston. I think they could beat Memphis. And they could knock somebody off. And they will knock somebody off. In fact, they might knock somebody out of the playoffs. But if you're a Renegades fan right now, you probably can't afford another loss. I don't know if six and four is going to make the playoffs in the XFL conference. So Memphis, what do you do with the boats? Only beating Houston. They were, that was an ugly win. They have not looked good. They blew a 16 point lead in week two. They look dismal offensively, especially up front. Front sevens dominate this league. And they now they know how to smack Memphis. And that's just get after the quarterback and, it's only a matter of time before Case Cookus is in serious danger for his health. They have got to find a way to protect him. And Houston's the worst team in the league. It was pathetic today. Uh, we talked about last week, will Houston win a game? That was their shot. That might have been their shot. 
I mean, they will get Memphis at home later in the season, but man, I don't know. Garantano's going to be out a few weeks. So I guess you roll with Sinet there, bringing the kid Henderson in at quarterback. But yeah, you got to figure something out on special teams or else you're going to turn into the Orlando Guardians of, of last year, <laughs> which did get a win, by the way. Sometimes I like to forget that that ever happened, but it did. So that's our power poll. If you were on podcast, we had Stallions 1, Battlehawks 2, Brahmas 3, Defenders 4. And on the outside, look it in, Panthers 5, who technically in this format would still make the playoffs. Renegades at 6, Showboats at 7, and the winless Houston Roughnecks. The lifeless Houston Roughnecks, which Zook will never bet on again, at 8. That's all she wrote for us tonight for the producer, director, and owner of Studio Z, Chris Zook. I'm Maddie Fresh. And don't you forget, there is no such thing as football season. We'll see you Thursday night back for a preview of week four.